you today. If you have your Bible, open up to Ephesians chapter 2. We'll start a new series today. And uh, we're just so thankful that you are here with us today. True story, his name was John. He was born in 1725, and he was a mess of a man. He uh, worked on a slave trade ship that would transport slaves from Africa across the Atlantic. He was a man that was hated by all of his shipmates. He was a raging drunk, and he was very violent. His nickname was the Great Blasphemer. Uh, his, I, you, you've heard that phrase, cuss like a sailor? Well, I think they learned that from John. In fact, his captain said, I quote, not only did he use the worst language I've ever heard, but he created new words that exceeded the limits of verbal debauchery. He was so hated by his shipmates that one time he fell overboard, and instead of thro throwing life preservers at him, they threw harpoons at him. So he wasn't well liked. He was arrogant. He was rebellious. And the captain one day decided he wouldn't take any more of it. So he stripped him naked, and he had him flogged eight dozen times in front of 350 men. John became so furious that he decided he was going to kill the captain, and then he was going to take his own life. But before he could do that, a huge storm hit the slave trade ship. And uh, in fact, one of the guys standing beside him was swept overboard, and they never found him. And it looked like the ship was going to break apart and crash. And in the midst of that, in the midst of desperation, in the midst of fear, he cried out saying, Lord, have mercy on us. And after a few minutes, a storm subsided and the boat held together. In the moment of his greatest desperation, he called out to the God that he had hated. So he started reading scripture and thinking, well, there must have been something to that. It wasn't just uh, something that just happened on its own. So he started reading Scripture, and he began being transformed by grace. Twenty-five years later, in 1772, John Newton picked up a pen, and on a piece of paper, he began to write the song that we just sang a few minutes ago, Amazing Grace. So I want you to feel the weight of those words of a man that was known as the great blasphemer that hated God. And everybody hated him, but his life was changed by the amazing grace of God. You know the song, it's there. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that did what? Saved a wretch like me. Say it with me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear. And grace my fear relieved, how precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. Starting a new series today entitled, How Sweet the Sound. And what we're going to do in this series is that we're going to pick out some hymns of the church that are old, and we haven't sung some of them in a long, long time. And we're going to look at the story behind the hymn. But not only that, we're also going to look at the theology built around that song. And so today we're looking at Amazing Grace, and we're going to teach on grace. So just give me a little grace as I teach on Amazing Grace. And, I, and as I thought about this, and as we began to pray as a staff on what songs that we would use and how we would use them, I, uh, I, I thought, why teach on grace? Right? I mean, we're all believers. We understand grace, right? Most of us. We understand that uh, this unmerited love and favor of God that he gives us. But I wonder if, I wonder if we really understand that grace. So when you look around this morning, you'll find a lot of people sitting here with guilt and condemnation. The enemy has been harassing you and telling you you're a failure. You'll never amount to anything. You'll never get better. And he's constantly harassing you. There are those that feel like your life is a failure. There are those of us that we're always performance-driven. I mean, we, we have deep father wounds, and so we're always trying to do something. If we do enough, we'll please God, and then God will be pleased with us. If I can just read the Bible enough, if I can just pray enough, if I can witness enough, then I'll get to the place where he's pleased with us. So, so we get caught in that performance mode. 
Some of us today, even as believers, live discouraged lives, feel rejected and feel uh, in that place that we're just inadequate. So I want to look today and I want to borrow uh, Paul's words in Ephesians chapter 2. And I want to talk about three things that grace is. Grace is unmerited, grace is undeserved, and grace is unearned. Grace is unmerited, undeserved, and unearned. Let me break those down for you. Uh, Here's the first fill in if you're taking notes. Grace is unmerited. It is unmerited. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. So follow along with me in your Bible if you have, because there's some phrases that I want you to circle and and to look at. Thank you for taking notes. That really encourages me when you take notes, because that means that you're going to be able to utilize these notes to help somebody else. It also may be an example as you are a seasoned believer, as you take notes, you're saying to those that are around you, I really believe that taking notes is part of a disciplined lifestyle. You know, we, we go to school, and if it's something we want to learn, We'll, we'll take notes in them. And I wonder sometimes that if we get to the place in coming to church that we just get used to listening and not taking notes and applying those to our life. So I just say thank you for those of you that are taking notes. It says, once you were, would you underline that phrase, you were? Once you were. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil the commander of the powers of the unseen world, the one that has a global influence. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. Satan is. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, there it is again, circle it. By our very nature, we were subject to, to God's anger, just like everyone else. When you study this in the Greek, what you're going to find is that it's like Paul violates every grammatical rule that he could violate. He has run-on sentences, incomplete sentences. But when you understand the background, Paul is looking at his life of how that he, what he used to be, you were. You know, sometimes I think we forget about Paul. He's the one who hated Christians and killed Christians by the hundreds. Uh, He he just despised uh, these little Christs, these Christians. We see pictures today on the news media of of believers pulled out beside the beach and uh, 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 covering over their head and guns held at their heads and say, deny Jesus or we'll kill you. And we've seen those pictures on, on TV and we've seen those pictures on the internet of Christians today in this world that are being slaughtered. And we look at those who slaughter them, and we say, how could they do that? But this is who Paul was. He was the one that was killing Christians. And so he says, at one time in my life, I remember how that I was driven by this this evil. And he says to all of us, you were. You were. Some of us, it's been a long time since we remembered how we used to be. Remember how you used to be? Remember how you were driven by passionate sin that kept you away from God so he said you were and then verse 4 here's the next two words I'd like for you to circle or underline but God first of all you were but now it is but God but God is so rich say this with me in mercy look at your neighbor and say he's rich rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, you see, you don't need a greater teacher if you're away from Christ. You don't need need another program. You're dead. If Christ is not living in your life today, you are spiritually dead. And, and, And there is no life in you. And you know that. You know there's something missing in your life today. But God is so rich in mercy, and He loved us so much that even though we were dead, Because of our sins, he gave us what? Life. When he raised Christ from the dead, it is only by God's grace that you've been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms. Because we are united with Christ, 
so God can point to us in all future ages as an example of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us as shown in all that he's done for us who are united in Christ Jesus. That's a brilliant passage there. How beautiful. It says, you were once dead in sin. You were once alienated, but you had a but God experience. And he's forgiven you of your sins. He's lifted you up, and he set you in heavenly places. And now today, God can point to you and to me as trophies of grace, not as trophies of anything that we have done, but trophies of grace. Would you look at your neighbor and say, you're a trophy of grace. You're a trophy of grace. And, and, and God likes to point to you. you. You may feel like you're nothing, but God says, let me point this one out. You see, Alex is a trophy of grace. You see, you were, but God. Now look at the next, here's the next two words I want you to circle. Verse 8, God saved you by his grace. Would you circle those three words, by his grace? You were, but God, by grace. When you believed, and you can't take credit for this, it's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for good things you've done so that none of us can boast about it. Can you imagine getting to heaven? And if it was all about our works that gets us there, can you imagine you'd, you'd get enough braggadocious people in this world? Can you imagine getting to heaven and somebody saying, how'd you get here? Well, I got here because I did this and I did that and I did something else. Ah, that's nothing compared to what I did. Let me tell you what I did. No, when I get to heaven, the only thing that will matter when I see his blood pierced side and his hands to remind me all I can say is thank you Lord even while I was a sinner you died for me I am here not because of my works but I'm here because of your amazing grace because of your amazing grace thank you Lord thank you Lord thank you Lord grace is unmerited first of all you were but God by grace how many of you remember that you were but aren't you thankful that you had a but God experience? Aren't you thankful that it's by His grace today? Second of all, grace is undeserved. I mean, how can you deserve grace? Romans, 8, Romans 3 and 24 says this, Yet God, in His grace, look at this, freely makes us right in His sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins by dying on the cross. That word grace, in a, in, when you transliterate that from Greek into English, it's the word C-H-A-R-I-S, charis. Some people name their daughter charis. Uh, some people pronounce it charis, however they pronounce it. Actually, in Greek, the K would be silence. So you'd pronounce it haris, haris. And it um, is the unmerited favor of God, the unmerited favor of God. But the amazing thing is, when the Holy Spirit gave inspiration to put the right words in the Bible, and I believe the Bible is the inspired written word of God, this word haris was a cultural Greek word that was used in, in their world. And it simply meant this, a benevolent gift from a superior to an inferior. A benevolent gift, unearned, undeserved, you, you don't get it, from somebody that's a superior to an inferior. Not that they're better than you, but that they have a supply of what you're lacking. So when you study this word in cultural Greek, you find that there were three people involved in this uh, transferring of a benevolent gift from a superior to an inferior. First of all, the best words that we can, we can come up from, from translating this from Greek into English, the first word would be a patron, P-A-T-R-O-N, a patron. And the patron would be the person who uh, has the provisions, uh, the person who has what you need. Uh, that would be the patron, the provision. The second word would be known as the client. The client is the one who's going to receive the gift. So, so I don't want us to go around and talk about God being the patron, but I just want you to understand 
the significance of this word, the historical word of this. So there is a, uh, there is a patron, somebody who provides. There's a client that receives. And there was a third person involved in this transaction. And they were called, as you transfer it over, they would be called the broker. The broker would be the one that would be in the community, and he would find somebody that had a need. For instance, if maybe there were a dozen kids in the community that had no shoes. So the broker would go out and say, oh, I, you, you need some shoes. So I'm going to take you to the one who can provide those shoes for you. And so the broker brings those kids that don't have shoes to the, to the guy that has a shoe store that can give them shoes and provide for them. But that's not all. Here's the kicker of this. The broker is the one who would not only bring the need to the person that had the provision, but they would be the one that would pay for the shoes for those kids. So if someone didn't ha had a need, then the broker would go out and say, let me take you to someone I know that can meet that need. And he would get there and he'd say, you can meet the need of this person that they have right now. And, and I'm willing to pay for it. I hope you already see where I'm going with this. Because God is the provider. And we are the recipients of amazing grace. But it was Jesus, the broker, who came to this world. And he saw us in need. And no way that we could get to God. And he said, I'll lay down my life. I'll pay the price. While they're yet sinners, I'll pay the price. So that they can find that redemption and that amazing grace. If that's happened to you today, would you give him a hand clap and a praise right now? <laughs> Undeserved. Paid in full. Boy, don't you like to get those receipts after you paid and paid and paid? It just says paid in full. But when you come to Jesus, the very moment you meet him, he doesn't say, well, look, we're going to put this on a layaway policy, and I'm going to see how good you do. And if you do good enough, one day I'll stamp paid in full. No, when I come as a blazing sinner, rebellious against him, and I say, Jesus, I believe in you. Would you save me? Would you place your amazing grace on me? He takes that blood, and he says, pay in full today. That's the amazing grace of this wonderful God. And number three, grace is unearned. It's unearned. Romans 11 and 6. And since it is through God's kindness or God's grace, then it's not by their good works. For in that case, God's grace would not be what it really is. Free and undeserved. He's saying, look, if it's grace plus something else, then that's not God's grace. God's grace is free and undeserved. I love this verse in 1 Corinthians 15 and 10. But whatever I am now, it is all because God poured out his special favor on me. Not without results. For I've worked harder than any of the other apostles. Look at this. But yet, it wasn't I, but God who was working through me by his grace. He said, even in all that I do, I, it was God that was, that, that was working through me. It's a free gift. You ever got a birthday gift? A birthday gift you, you like, you know? Sometimes you get a gift and you say, what is it? But, you know, a birthday gift that you really like. And nobody then says, did you like it? Yeah, I liked it. Well, it'll be 50 bucks for that gift I gave you for your birthday. No, that only happens if you have kids. You say, whoa, I like the gift that you got me. Yeah, I'll put it on your card. Not with God. It's undeserved and free. And even all that we work at, it's because he's working in us and through us. I'm going to show you a picture of grace today that I hope you'll never forget. It's about a father and son. And some of you know this story and some of you have seen it before. But, I, but I'd like for you to just remind you today. It's uh, Rick and, and Dick Hoyt. Uh, Rick, when he was born, uh, he was born with an umbilical cord around his neck. It cut off the oxygen. And uh, he was never able to walk or talk. But his parents understood that he was extremely intelligent. And he would communicate with his eyes. 
So the parents actually taught him the alphabet, and he would do the alphabet using his eyes. He was extremely intelligent. In 1973, they uh, found a group of engineers that designed and built a computer so that this young boy could use his eyes and he could type out words to his parents. And then he would use his head to hit a, a cursor to move it to the next. So he began to communicate with them. When he was uh, around 15, one of his friends was in an accident and he was paralyzed. They were going to have a 5K race to raise money for this young boy that was paralyzed. And using the computer, the young boy said, Dad, I want to run in that race. Now, the dad had never run before, and so he started training. And he pushed the, his son in a wheelchair. And after the race was over, the boy said, tapping out with the computer, Thank you. That was the first time in my life that I didn't feel handicapped. After that, they ran 72 marathons, 257 triathlons, and for those of you who don't know, a triathlon is 2.4 miles swimming, 26.2 miles running, and 112 miles biking. So when his father, Dick, swims, he pulls his son on a life raft behind him. And then when they cycle, Rick is on the front seat on the bike, and then when they run, he's in a chair, and his dad is pushing him. I want to show you a picture of grace, and I hope you never forget it. Watch. Who taught the sun where to stand? And who told the ocean you can only come this far? And who showed the moon where to hide till evening? Whose words alone can catch a falling star? Well,
I am that young man in the shed. Everything I've ever done, it's because the Father's been pushing me, pulling me, and carrying me. And all he's asking from you today, if you just get in the chair and let him push you, pull you, and carry you through life. No, I really think what he's saying this morning, let me just pick you up and let me put you in the chair. You were but God by grace. I loved when the son coming across the finish line, Andrea said this later, he's so excited. He, he, he was triumphant, but he didn't do anything. He was just riding. It was the Father that was carrying him, pushing him. Sometimes we can think that we're really all of that and something else. But really, it's because of God's amazing grace. Would you mind standing with me? And I want to read just a couple of more scriptures, and then we're, gonna, we're just going to see what God would do this morning, what he would have for us to do. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, I'm reminded... Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You were. You were. But then verse 4, but God is so rich in mercy that he loved us so much. He loved us so much. He gave his life. We're raised with Christ from the dead. And verse 8 and 9, for by grace... For by grace, read it with me, for by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. You were, but God, by grace. Not works, but by grace. Not religion, but by grace. Not human efforts, but by grace. Not on your perfection, but by grace. What about the grace of God? Remember Jesus, one time in town, uh, the, the priests, the Pharisees, had caught the woman in the very act of adultery. And they pulled her out. They took her from the very act, so that means that she was probably naked. And in her humiliation and shame, they threw her down in the dirt, and they surrounded her. And they said, you know what the Bible, you know what the law says? adultery, you stone them. Jesus looks at the situation and he stoops down. He stoops down. He doesn't stand over, but he stoops down. You see, grace always stoops to where we are. And he began writing in the sand. It's the only sermon Jesus ever wrote, but we don't know the words. But many people think that he probably wrote the sins of of those that were standing around because he said the first one without a sin you throw the first stone so the Bible says from the oldest to the youngest they began to walk away and drop their stones the woman is in humiliation on the ground Jesus is there eye level not over her but eye level and he looks around and he says where are your accusers they've, they've all gone listen to grace Neither do I accuse you. But go and sin no more. Grace stoops to where we are this morning. There are some of you that are here today and say, you know, there's something missing in my life. I just feel desperate for something else. Here's what it is. You need a but God moment. You need a but God moment today. Because all of our attempts at self-salvation leads to exhaustion. Because in one moment, in one prayer, one Savior can change everything in your life today. You can call on the name of Jesus, and he hears our prayers, and he forgives our sins, and we're made right not by works, but by his grace. You were, but God, by his grace. 
It's not that you're going to be... Hey friends, thanks for joining us today for this great teaching. And I believe it was very impactful to you. I love this series as we're looking at the hymns of the church. And, and they've ministered to people for years, but I believe today's really spoke to you. In fact, I'm so excited to just think about that Jesus loves us so very much and he has a plan for our life. Uh, you're not an accident, but you're on purpose. And um, I would just encourage you, if you've never surrendered your heart to the Lord, if you've never made him Lord of your family, I'd love to lead you in a prayer today to make that decision. Would you pray this prayer with me? Lord Jesus, I surrender my life to you. I turn over my life to you. I realize that you died for my sins and you rose on the third day to give me new life, a fresh start. And as best as I know how I want to serve you the rest of my life, I pray that today in Jesus' name. Listen, if you prayed that prayer with me today, I have a book that I want to give you. If you just call the church office and let them know, hey, I'd like to have that book. I, I gave my heart to the Lord. Then we'll be able to send that to you. And if you don't have a Bible, just let us know. I'll be happy to send you a Bible because that Bible is going to give you direction for your life. I want you to know that we love you and we thank you so much for joining us. I would like to say if you have a prayer request, you can also leave that at the church office when you call. And if you, this ministry has been a blessing to you, I would really encourage you to just ask God what he would have for you to invest in this ministry. That we can continue to spread the gospel. That we can continue to keep our missionaries on the field and make a difference because Jesus is coming very soon. Listen. Thanks for watching, and I hope you'll be watching every week with us here at the Father's House because we don't really care where you've been. We care where you're going. Thank you again for watching. We'll see you next week.